All right, welcome into Conscious Conversations. I'm your host, Nick Paladino King, with my co-host, Nathan Garg. Hey, hey. Today, we got a super special guest, Kale Owen. He's the CEO of Gym Launch, Prestige Labs, and gymowners.com. Kale, how's it going? Welcome to the show. It is great. It is a pleasure to be on here. I'm honored to be on here talking with y'all. Super excited just to dive into whatever we're going to dive into today. Likewise, likewise. Um, Super excited, too, just to share, you know, Kale, you've been a part of my life for the last year and a half as I've been a member of, of Gym Launch and your company, uh, your coaches, you know, everything that you guys stand for has drastically changed my life. Uh, it's changed the life of the community around me, my family. So I'm super excited for you to be on. And that's one of the main reasons we wanted to get you on is that you've you've had such an impact on so many people's lives and your, as your company has. Um, so really excited to hear what you've got to share about business, relationship, communication. So um, yeah, we'll kind of kick it off, kick it off from here if that sounds good. Let's do it. Let's do it. Cool. So, Kale, Kale, we'd love to know, you know, you've had a, a pretty cool trajectory, a pretty cool last about five years of your career. Uh, we'd love for you to kind of paint the pictures for our listeners of, you know, maybe who you were before um, and, and who you are now and what's really led you to be such a big leader in the space of health and fitness and wellness. We'd love to just kind of hear about your own journey and, um, you know, kind of where you are now and, and when and then where we're going from here. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'll try to keep this as brief as possible. I think it's good to start back when I was younger. So interesting facts about me. One of them is that I was homeschooled my entire life. So uh, my first class I ever went to was my freshman year in college. And my mom taught me up until the age of roughly about 13 or 14. And uh, my dad, my mom was a stay at home mom. I had three sisters. I was the only boy. And she taught me up until that point. And then I got to a point where she really couldn't teach me anything else at that point. So I pretty much was ready to graduate high school at the age of 15. But there was one thing that was keeping me super focused on both school and everything else that was baseball. So when you talk about like, what kind of shaped me, I, at the age of eight, I saw my first professional baseball game on TV. And I saw this guy named Derek Cheater. Um, If you're not familiar with him, he's in the Hall of Fame, but hopefully everyone is familiar with him. Uh, New York Yankees shortstop. And I remember seeing him play and I was like, I want to do that. I was like, I grew up with footballs in my hand, baseballs, you name it. My dad was a professional golfer back in the day, and I just became obsessed with baseball from the age of eight and ended up playing from the age of eight until 23. And that shaped a lot of who I am today from my work ethic, how I work with other team members, how I think about leadership, how I think about performance and pressure and communication. And I had the unique opportunity of playing high school, college, and then a little bit, I joke around, it's a cup of coffee in the minor league system for the Phillies. So I had a, had a blast doing that, learned a ton, got to meet some incredible people, was mentored and coached by both incredible individuals and coaches, as well as horrible coaches at the same time. So I got the whole spectrum of you name it, right? Um, <laughs> from, the, from the coach that just yells at you all the time and expects you to just perform at that to the coach that you know really does care about you, gives you great feedback, coaches you and is patient with you. And I got to see all of that. Um, but what this did was it sparked an interest for me as I got older, I noticed that I didn't have the genetic, natural genetic ability that a lot of other baseball players had. I'm, I'm small. I'm short of 5'9". I was tiny. I was weighed 150 pounds when I played pro ball. I was super small, but it became an obsession for me on sports performance. How can I maximize my performance on the field through strength and conditioning? And that led me into, after I got released, into partnering with a buddy of mine to start a gym in Tampa. So I ended up doing that. And then... We were terrible at business, by the way. My gosh, we were horrible. Uh, had knew nothing about business. And this is coming from the guy that graduated with a, a business degree in college and knew no had no idea about how to market, how to advertise, how to sell, any of that. We just, you know, we did like a lot of gym owners did or do today. What year is this, roughly? What year is this? Uh, that was 2012 is when we started. Okay. So I got released in 2011. I had a, a quick little job working in with a company out of St. Petersburg, Florida doing behavioral assessments. We did DISC assessments and we created e-learning around that. And we taught people like at Raytheon and other engineering companies, massive engineering companies with defense contracts. We taught them, taught them how to adjust their behaviors based on other people's behaviors. So how to recognize it and then adjust it. So I, I got to learn how to be on camera there, use a teleprompter, mm-hmm. understand behavior, which is really cool. And, but my dream was to you know own a gym and train people, be on the floor and help them feel better and all that good stuff. So I did that. Wasn't very successful at all. Made no money. Was coaching baseball to try to make some money. Got married. Still no money. And 
then ended up getting the opportunity to start a gym in St. Augustine, Florida, which is where I went to school, where I went to college. My wife went to college there as well and ended up moving up in 2014, started the gym in 2015. And again, didn't learn from my mistakes previously. Started it two years in where it's roughly like March or April of 2017. And I'm eight weeks from shutting my doors. I sit down, Maggie and I, my wife, we sit down and we talk. And I just, we just have a frank conversation about like where we're at. And we were not doing well. We were losing $3,000 a month. Uh, we had at the time 33 members, which is not a lot after two years of trying to make it work, doing all the wrong things and ended up getting a job with a local web design agency and was doing sales for them. Cause I was like, I got to put food on the table at this time. We had a one-year-old a month later, found out my wife was pregnant with our second in 2016, just to wrap this up, kind of like add context to this for anyone in 2016, my combined tax returns with my wife was less than $30,000 with a one-year-old living out of a one bedroom studio apartment. I have no idea how we made it work, but we just, we somehow did. So you make, you make it work. That's how it's just it's make it work. You figure it out. You figure it yeah. out. You don't go out, you don't do date nights. You don't eat out. You do everything you possibly can to save as much money as possible and scratch and claw your way through it. And we, in later on in May or so, I ended up finding and joining Gym Launch as a client first. Nick, obviously you're a member of Gym Launch and absolutely mm -hmm. crushing it. And that completely changed the trajectory of our life. And my wife was bartending at the time, pregnant and bartending. And I was like, I don't want you bartending. Like I want you to, you know, not have to do that. And she wanted to be in the gym. We wanted to work together. So our gym quickly blew up using the systems that we teach at Gym Launch. And between really June of 2017 and January of 2018, we went from 33 members to over 250 reoccurring members, not counting, you know, trial members or anything like that. And we were able to get out of our gym and really just enjoy time with the family, had a team running it, all that stuff. And later on, getting to kind of bringing this all home to talk about the trajectory of where I'm at right now. In, I would say, April of 2018, I saw an ad from Alex Ramosi, the founder of Gym Launch, talking about how they're hiring a salesperson. And I shot him a Facebook message and I was just like, hey, send me your presentation deck and I'll do it for free. I was like, I love this company. I love what you guys have done for me. Shoot, I'll just do it. And he just replied back and he's like, I'm, that's great, but I'm looking for someone full time. And I said, okay, well, I mean, I, I'm interested. He's like, well, would you be able to do it full time? And I said, yes, I'm already, I already have a full time job, mm -hmm. which he hated, by the way. He told me so many times, he's like, quit your full time job and go all in on the gym. <laughs> job. Anyways, I, I ended up joining as a salesperson, I think in, it was April, end of April and 2018. And then ended up doing that, just doing sales. I had no aspirations of management, moving up in the company, CEO, like that was never a thought. I mean, Alex is the founder, Layla, his wife, their co-founders. I mean, these are incredible people and mm -hmm. I just want to be a part of the culture and I wanted to learn. That was the key thing. And so when we think about like key things for me is I got in and I was like, wow, you know, I have massive deficits as a leader, as a business person, there are skills that I want to acquire. And this, I think is the best way for me to at least try that. And it turned out to be a, a great place to do that. So I learned how to sell B2B. I then went into sales management and learned how to manage sales teams. And then I went into coaching um, and I built a coaching team of coaches back in 2019. Um, and then I went into, became general manager in 2020 and right before the old C word happened and everything shut down and got to be GM for gym launch alone for almost two years. And then over the course of that time, I got to spend a ton of one-on-one -on -one time with Alex and Layla Hermosi, uh, weekly one-on-ones mm -hmm. with Alex, uh, constantly texting, constantly messaging back and forth, weekly or monthly one-on-ones with Layla, and really got to learn how to think strategically as a business owner, how to communicate, how to lead, how to think through problems, how to identify constraints in a business, how to work with other people, and how to create amazing opportunities within the business world for your business as well as for people that um, are on your team. And then we got acquired by American Pacific Group, which is based out of San Francisco. Um, they're a private equity firm. We got acquired in uh, literally Christmas Eve, 2021. And Alex and Layla stepped out from the business. That was their goal. They didn't want to have to be in the business. And they moved me into the CEO role for the entire portfolio. At that time, we only had two companies. Um, we had Gem Launch and Prestige Labs. And since then, we've started another one and it's in the middle of its building phase and development stage. And that's gymowners.com. And I've been CEO for two years and that leads me to here. Hopefully that was, un that was a little long-winded, but hopefully that brings everybody up to speed of where I'm at now.
Yeah, it, wow. it does. And I mean, what's, what's standing out for me, Kel, is like the timeline timeline almost doesn't add up as you're, mm-hmm. as you're talking. Right. And it's like, how, and maybe you can shed some light on this. Like, how did you go from, you know, pretty much in the space where I actually am today, right. Of like running a successful gym, which is in itself so hard. And I mean, such a different monster and beast than running a, a corporation. How, like, how the hell have you gone from in five years, you know, running, running a local gym to now being the, the head of a company that is, you know, I think doing 50 million a year and you guys are, are worldwide and you're, you're major players in the game. Like how, how have you increased your capacity uh, and your skill set so quickly? Yeah, that's a great question. Well, let me first start off by saying, Nick, that I think anyone can do it as long as they acquire the skill set, right? And that is, it's funny, I saw a quote and it was, you know, God will sell you anything, but the price, the payment is work. And so if you want anything, you have to be willing to work and you have to be willing to work more than what the average person is willing to do. And I think as gym owners and Nick, you're a perfect example of this. You're willing to put in the work to achieve an incredible outcome and to achieve whatever goal you have. And I think that, you know, owning the gym was the first step in helping me understand business overall. And I knew that the gym was not my final place. It wasn't what I knew I wanted to do long-term. I actually hired Gym Launch to build it so I could sell it. So I could see if I actually had what it took to build something successfully. Um, And so I did that. And then I was like, okay, now there's, I realized during that time I had deficits. I didn't know how to sell high ticket um, B2B products. I knew how to sell direct to consumers with what we had. And I had done a little bit of B2B selling with the agency I was with, but it wasn't really crazy high ticket. I mean, we're talking maybe $5,000 a month retainers for like six months or something like that. But I wanted to learn how to sell higher ticket. I had no, again, like I said, I had no aspirations of management or anything like that. But when I joined Gym Launch, I immediately thought about it from the frame of, I know what it's like as an employer when you're hiring an employee. I know what a good employee is like, and I know what a bad employee is like. And I was like, I'm going to be the best employee ever just because I know what it's like. And I care about Alex and Layla. I care about the team. I don't want to be the type of person that comes in and is a complete F up and doesn't listen, doesn't learn, doesn't apply what they do and doesn't work hard enough. I was like, I'm not going to do that. And so I took the same Mm -hmm. mental mindset and framework that I used in baseball, which is I'm going to outwork everyone and I'm going to do every little thing to the best of my ability regardless of my skill set. And I'm just going to continue every day to work to acquire more skill sets. And I applied that to it. And three months later, the director of sales came to me. He's like, Hey, you know, I have this management role available and I think you're the right guy for it. And I was shocked. I've been shocked at every promotion I've gotten. I I think I Mm -hmm. have a a fairly lower view of myself when it comes to other people. Um, That stems from baseball as well. Back in the day, I always feel like I'm the underdog and I've always just realized I need to work harder than everybody else. And what I, when I got into management, that, that literally was a stepping stone for me to truly understand my deficits and become more self-aware of the skills that are required to truly lead a company. And that's when I noticed, okay, I'm really good at selling to consumers first in the gym. I'm pretty good at leading a small team on stuff like this. I'm pretty good at managing retention for a, a group of 250 clients. And I'm pretty good at this, but I know that I'm not the best. Then I got into sales and I'm like, I'm pretty good at being able to sell $124,000 contracts, which is what we were selling at the time back in the day. And then I was like, okay, I got into management and I was like, shoot, I'm not very good at leading great salespeople. So now I was Mm -hmm. like, okay, how do I learn to lead great salespeople? How do I develop great salespeople? How do I hire them? How do I recognize them? How do I hire them? How do I train them? How do I get them up to speed as quickly as possible? How do I cut away all the BS and get them executing at an extremely high level constantly? How do I keep them energized, keep their conviction high? How do I coach them consistently? And so I started diving deep into that. And then I realized I had other skill set issues, which were, I didn't really know how to think strategically as a business outside of my own little world, right? I'm, I'm in the sales department and all I'm thinking about is how do we increase sales? And what I started to realize as I kind of looked at the rest of the company, I was like, how can I help affect other departments? How can I help affect the business as a whole from my position? And that led into being a coaching manager. And then that was a whole new set. I need to teach people who are experts in their own realm because we hired coaches who were clients of ours and already running gyms. How do Mm -hmm. I teach them how to influence people and to teach our system. So I had to train them on how we needed to be coached, create, help create the curriculum, help create the training structure, onboarding them, finding the right people, going through the hiring process. 
developing that, then managing that, keeping them up to speed, making sure help to balance their life because they're full-time in their gym while also having to coach a bunch of clients. And then getting into the GM role was a whole nother world. That was realizing, okay, I've only had to touch and be a part of a couple different departments, but now I'm overseeing finance. Not like totally, we had a CFO at the time, but like, I need to look at finance. I need to look at HR. Mm -hmm. I need to look at IT. I need to look at all of these. How do these all work together as a system to be able to move the business forward? So if I wanted to bring a new play forward or a new offer forward, it's not like it was in sales where it's just like, cool, let's mm -hmm. change the script. Let's change the offer. Let's roll. It's like, okay, how does this affect HR? How does this affect IT? How does this affect finance? Do we need to con like all these, you know, little things that happen. And I started realizing that one of the things that helped me a ton is I started batching my learning based on my skills needed. And I looked, I was self-aware where I would take a second. And I would think ahead. Like if I wanted to get, if I wanted to be the best that I could possibly be in this role, what are the skills that I'm lacking? And I would ask for feedback from Alex and Layla and other people. And I would receive that feedback. I'd chunk it down into something that I could do for a quarter. And then I would dive into everything I possibly could on my free time to improve that skill for that quarter. And then the next quarter, I'd move on to the next thing. And then I'd kind of test, reassess, am I getting better? I'd receive feedback from other people. And that's in a way how I thought about it. I thought about it as skill stacking. So each skill will stack on top of the other to where you get a, a at least a decently polished product at the end as you continue to stack it. Um, similar to what Alex talks about with skill stacking, same with Layla and other individuals in the business world today. But that's how I thought about it. And I broke it down into three month chunks. And as I got into the GM role, I realized really in 2021, I, I took longer instead of three month chunks. I kind of moved it into six month or year long chunks of like, what's my focus right now for the year? And to this day, I just, my mantra to myself and my team is, my leadership team is like, we get paid to learn every day. We get paid to learn how to be better leaders, how to be better executors, better communicators. Um, and we get paid every day to learn. And we get paid every day to go out and change the world through the gym owners that we serve. And it's our job to arm them with everything that they can possibly have to change the world in their community. So. I love that. <clears throat> that was that was so heartfelt. I mean, I know that you threw a lot of um, core facts and core things that you did to get you where you are, but it was also so heartfelt. I could feel the like dedication in that, the striving, just the, you had such a high level of self-awareness because even to be able to say, Hey, I want to go develop those skill sets in yeah. order to raise my, you know, raise myself as a, as a product, as a member of this larger team. And then to be able to lean into mentors, you were probably surrounded, you know, surrounded by one of the best out there that a lot of us are learning from, uh, whether through mm -hmm. his podcast, uh, you know, and all the thing, all the ways that he teaches out there. Uh, but what a trajectory. You just want to take a second to say like how you leaned into Definitely. it. It's just uh, so inspiring. I, knew, I appreciate that. But it, I think it's, you know, from the outside, it's like, this is a crazy trajectory, but when you're in the middle of it, mm -hmm. it's, it sucks. It's hard, right? Like we're going through a tough time in the business right now because we have, I have things that I want to do as for the business, for our clients, like Nick, for you and for others that I want to do. But we're in a time right now where from our leadership team and some other things, we need to level them up to allow us the freedom and the space to be able to do those things that we want to. So we're not quite at that place where we can really unveil the things that we really want to do. Um, and it's frustrating at times because I want to move really, really fast. But during those times when I was growing, you know, it, a lot of it's, I mean, it's long days. I mean, it's two, I mean, it was really four straight years of working, thinking about the business and thinking about my role, even though I wasn't a CEO 24 seven, like I'm mm -hmm. thinking about it. I'm waking up at 4 AM. I'm going to work out, coming back and I'm working until 7 PM. I'm trying to learn. I'm trying to get better, spending time with the family as much as we can maintaining that integration, that work-life integration. and. You know, I remember one time I thought I was going to get fired. I was coaching manager, hop on a call uh, with Alex and Layla. Suddenly they call me on a call and the first words out of Alex's mouth are like, what the F, Kale? And I'm like, oh, shoot, is this the day? Like, is this like, it, mm -hmm. am I going to get fired today? And, you know, that was a turning point as well. I think for him, he mentions it as like, this is when I knew I think you had what it takes to be a leader where I turned around, I worked all night and I got him the report that he wanted and continued to dive in. But it's it's not easy, but at the end of, on the other side of that pain and the suffering that people, that we all go through and it's all relative, right? The pain and suffering is all relative. And for me, fortunate enough, the, the pain and suffering was not hard compared to other people. But for me, 
going through that on the other side of that for all of us is, you know, the person that we become or the person we can become. Mm. So if someone is going through that, those hard times where it just feels like every day is hard and a grind and a battle uphill where you start, you get up the hill and then the next day it starts right back down at the bottom. And at the other side of that is really the person you can become. And that for me is the journey that I love the most. And I was having a conversation with Mike, uh, Nick, with Mike Ferreira on our mm -hmm. team yesterday, just yesterday talking about this and like how I just, I genuinely love the hardship and the pain because every day I get to wake up and look in the mirror and be like, today's the day you get to test yourself and see what kind of man you really are. And are you willing to step up to the plate? Are you willing to show up for your team? Are you willing to make the hard decisions? Are you willing to say the things that other people won't say and become the man that you want to become the future you? And are you going to make that person proud today? Yeah. I mean, and that's something I heard you say in there, Kale, earlier was you, I don't know if you quite said it, but it was like, you had an identity of who you wanted to become. So even before you were CEO, it's like, you're almost saying like, what would a CEO do in this situation? Or like, if I want to become this person, what are the things I need to do? And, um, you know, I can just share before we found you guys, maybe, you know, a year and a half, two years ago, I, w I sat down with my brother, my business owner and a hard conversation. I think we can go this direction. And we said, look, man, like, I can't do this anymore. Like either, either, either we grow or we die. And I know that's actually a mantra you guys use it, but we were saying that before we found you, which was so interesting. I was like, Billy, like, I can't be in the middle, man. I like, this is, this is killing me. Like I, either we grow or we die. And I was like, and I don't even care to tell you the truth. I don't care if this thing crashes and burns or if we, if we grow it and we sell it, I'm like, but we just got to pick a direction. And it was such a hard conversation, especially to have with, with my brother, uh, who's also my business partner, right? Cause now it's affecting more than just the business, you know, it's family stuff. And, and we sat there and I remember him looking at me like he didn't want to hear it. Like he did not want to hear it. And, and the next day or two, he came back and he goes, all right, like, let, let's do it, you know? And then that's when we went and found you guys. And that's when we decided like, okay, if we want to be these people that we, that we think we are, and we talk about being like, we need to, we need to get better at marketing, at selling, at serving, you know, at leading all these things. And I can look back and go, it was, it was that hard conversation of realizing like we weren't walking the walk, even though a lot of people around us thought that we were, and we could have, and we were, I think we were fooling a lot of people at that time. Um, you know, so I, I'm interested, Kale, for you, like, how do you have these hard conversations, which I know is a, a crux of, you know, what you focus on, like, how do we set ourselves up to have hard conversations that matter, um, you know, and do, and do them in a way that is, um, you know, mindful and self-aware. Yeah. It's so funny. I just did a podcast on similar to this with Maggie this morning. Um, and it's fresh in my mind. So a couple things, one of our core tenants here at gym launch is don't sugarcoat it. And what we mean by that is, you know, it is our job to tell the truth and the truth is left best left untampered with. And when you think about it that way, as well as you think about it this way, where it is not our responsibility on how the person we're giving feedback to, or we're having the hard conversation with, it's not their emotional response or their response to this and how they feel about that hard conversation is not our responsibility. It is our responsibility to simply tell the truth. Um, now we should do this with grace and I'll get into that in just a second and do it well. But mm -hmm. if we don't do that, it doesn't serve us. And our ability to have hard conversations is a direct correlation to our ability to grow. And when we're able to do that consistently, your growth, both personally and professionally will exponentially increase. It's going to be nuts. If anybody's listening to this and you're struggling with this, if you go out and start having direct conversations with people and start telling the truth actually telling the truth in a way that is graceful, honest, and creates a place for pre people to engage with you, you will be shocked at what you get back. And mm -hmm. it's absolutely incredible. And I know it helped me because growing up, I was more of a tend to be more of a people pleaser and wanting to say what other people wanted and wanting to just mm -hmm. get that way because it served me and it rewarded me growing up as a homeschool kid, not really fitting in, moving every three years growing up. And so like always having to figure out where I stand and with baseball teams and friends and make new friends and all this stuff. And when we made the switch, Maggie and I had the commitment to not sugarcoating it and having direct feedback, that's when our lives really began to take off and both business and personal. Um, so the thing that we think about with this is number one, it's, it's our responsibility to tell the truth regardless of the other person's reaction to it when, and you have to do it as quickly as you possibly can. So we think about giving feedback or we think about having a hard conversation. Those fierce conversations have to happen as quickly as you possibly can. 
And the reason why is if we continue to sit on it, it will continue to build up. And then what will happen is as we build this up, when we go to have that conversation, we'll have this pent up emotion that we're going to bring into the conversation in the space that's then going to derail the ultimate mission of that conversation. So the sooner that we can do it, the fresher it's on our mind and the less emotional we will typically be on it. Now, there are times when you have an immediate reaction to something and you create an emotion and you could have anger, you could have whatever. That is not the time to do it, but you shouldn't have mm -hmm. a, a problem where you're sitting on it for months or weeks or whatever. It should be as, as mm -hmm. soon as you possibly can. And then when you have that conversation, those tough conversations, number one, it has to come from a place where you don't have your ego involved because you're talking about the truth and it has to be centered on facts. It has to be logical. And we have to, our goal here is to keep it as, keep as little emotion as possible in the conversation. And when you have those, it has to be, there has to be a reason like, here's what's happening or here's how I'm feeling. Here's how, this is why I'm perceiving it this way. Your intentions may not be this way if you're having a personal conversation, or it's like, I know that we've tried really hard on the business or we've tried really hard on this project. However, here's what we're seeing. Here's what I'm seeing. Here's my reaction to this. And this is why this is a problem. And then list out all the things. And then from there, it's great. Now it opens up a conversation of how do we solve this? And that doesn't mean that the person that brings it up has to be the person to solve it, but it needs to create an open space for other people to either immediately feel relief that if you're in a team setting, they feel relief like, oh, great. Okay. Our leader recognizes that there is a problem and now there's an open space for us to be able to give this feedback. Or if you're in a relationship, it creates an open space for the person to now reciprocate that and understand, cool, you're right. Things aren't feeling right. Now we can have a conversation around how do we fix this? How do we move forward from this? How do we solve this? And sometimes you don't have the answer right away, but just having that conversation creates the opportunity for that. Um, and I think really tonality plays a big key. I think making sure that you're, you go through it at a very kind of simple pace, really calm tone and making sure that there's no emotion. I think it's the key across the board when you do that. Hmm. I, I love that. Nith and I have both been pract uh, practitioners of yoga for, for a very long time. And what you're talking about is actually a very yogic approach. Like recognize that there's a, an emotion or something off, like center yourself. And then in a, in a kind way, in a loving way, like be present and have an honest conversation and then do your best to move forward together and, you know, in a win-win. I think that's, it's just a, such a beautiful, like mindful, conscious way of running business and relationship. I think it, and that's not easy, by the way, like sometimes the easier thing is to be like, I'm pissed off. I'm taking someone's head off and like, that's it. Cause I'm the boss. It's like, yeah. no, that's, yeah. See how that one works out, you know, and I've done that. I'm sure we all have. Yeah. yeah. Well, or, it's, it's or, you know, it leads to. Uh, or leads to hiding from the conversation that actually needs yes. to be had, right? Because it's too scary or too risky. And we build this whole story behind it, which keeps us shut off from what could be actually a, a greater possibility, a deeper relationship, greater understanding. Yeah. Is it, wasn't, uh, I think Layla said this and Alex has talked about this before, but Layla originally said this and I, I remember hearing this from her. She's basically, she said fear, right? Is a mile wide, but an inch deep. And you think about it, it's, an, it's like an ocean, right? That's just miles wide. And you think that the depths of it are so deep that you could never come out of it. And the fear that we have and the beliefs and stories that we tell ourselves is that this is something that I can never swim out of. I can, I'm going to drown in this and I'm going to fail. But then when you actually take that first step forward and acknowledge that and confront your fear, you realize that it's really just an inch deep. And it was nothing compared to the stories that we all create for ourselves. Mm -hmm. And Man, it's so freeing when you have these types of conversations. It's what my wife and I's relationship is grounded on. And I'll give you guys an example. Just recently, like a couple of weeks ago, my wife came to me and we worked together. She's number two in the company. And um, she basically just straight up told me, she's like, you know what? It hasn't, the last month working for you hasn't really been that fun. <laughs> and I was like, my first reaction immediately was like, oh, this is really interesting. And it wasn't, and it, which is really cool for me because six years ago, eight years ago, if you would have asked me, I would have been like immediately hurt and, you know, offended and like, how can mm -hmm. you say that all that stuff. But since doing this, just like training anything else, you just continue to train it where now you show up in a way where ego was stripped away. And I saw it as a learning opportunity. And I was like, oh, wow, that's, that's really interesting. Thank you for the feedback. Let's talk about like, why is that? Why have you felt that way? Which then created a space for her to then work through the problem verbally with me. And the issues, which then I was able to walk away with some things that I can take and do to improve our working relationship. Um, that's just a small example, but you know, there's 
There's yeah. a lot of different things that people can do, but man, the, the dividends are insane. That's beautiful. And, you know, cause sometimes actually when we verbalize, we have the same thing in our, you know, you know, with me and my wife and like, sometimes when we verbalize something that we feel is a gap, often we don't really ourselves have full clarity on why the gap exists. Yeah. So when the two parties can mm -hmm. come together and be like, okay, I'm feeling something or there's something happening. There's some dynamic that isn't perfect and you can actually discuss it. And actually one of the things I was, I was really, that was resonating with me when you were just describing that kill is like coming at a situation from a place of curiosity and openness rather mm -hmm. than like a judgment or jumping to a conclusion, which often shuts it down, puts the other person on defensive mm -hmm. and, you know, you go down a different negative spiral versus you come at it from curiosity and openness. You can actually try to understand each other, you know, and we don't try to label the art, you know, you're wrong in feeling this or why would you be feeling this versus like, oh, I'm curious. Yeah, what's what's happening here? You know, what have you know, what have I done differently or whatever you what are you noticing that perhaps I'm not even noticing at all in myself? And suddenly you have a very different conversation. I'm curious actually, so what resulted from that conversation for you? So you had that heart to heart conversation. Yeah. And what came up? Give me an exact example at first. So we had to we talked for a while. We talked for probably 30, 45 minutes trying to work through this. And for context for us, like we usually find constraints really, really fast and we work through them. Um but we were, we got to the point where at the end of the day, what she realized was I was not giving direct feedback on exactly what I wanted based on where our teams are at, which would cause by doing that, by not giving direct feedback or direct, um, clear directions, like very clear directions, like you need to do this. You need to own this. This is how the project should be done. By not doing that, it put more work on her plate and created more confusion for her on what the expectation was. Her job, her role is VP of operations. So think like COO. And so her job is to take what I have as well, my ideas and vision, as well as what the other teams and make sure that we can go out and roll these out really, really well with yeah. everyone involved. And that was creating issues for her. And so that's something that I'm making sure that's top of mind for me, that as I speak to our teams, as I speak to her and other people, that I'm, I'm way more just direct and clear with my expectations. And it's funny, you know, I thought I was because it's gotten way better over time. But again, there's always new levels to it. Mm -hmm. And then you realize, mm -hmm. okay, if we need to move faster, you need to be even more clear with your um, examples. Like one example that she gave and she noticed this for herself is with our teams, she noticed that she always says, we, we will do this or we can do this. And she realized that this was a crutch for her team and slowing down all the teams that we have because it wasn't clear enough. Instead of saying to the person who should own the project, you need to own this. You should yeah. do this. Here is your deadline. And it's just small things. It's basics, right? Mm -hmm. It's always basics. Yeah. But those little things, it's, they add up. What What's interesting is and I'm wondering if I saw one of your posts recently about this because I was in a meeting with my team on Monday and I go, guys, we can't keep doing what we're doing of having conversations and no one owning owning the project. I was like, moving forward, we can collaborate but someone's got to own it. And I'm just wondering like if, if that was from something I watched from you and as I'm talking out loud, that's really the importance of doing stuff like this. You know, and for anyone listening, it's like the conversations you have and put out there can really affect other people's lives. Like instantly, like instantly. I heard that. I was like, yeah, you're right. I'm not giving ownership to my team. It's the same thing as, as Maggie. I'm saying, we got to do this. And then no one does it yeah. right at the end of the day. And that's, that's exactly. And then it's like, oh, why are we all frustrated? It's like, well, no one owned it. Um, you know, and just to share, I had a really hard conversation with my wife on Sunday, kind of like a, a come to Jesus moment of like, Hey, is this working anymore? You know, and, and not, mm -hmm. not a fun conversation. And we, we've both been avoiding having a conversation for a couple of weeks. And, and something I said to her was, you know, I have been avoiding this conversation because I don't want to say something that's going to make you sad. And, and it, it was, it felt good to say that and kind of frame of like, that's actually why I've been withholding is because I, I don't want to oversay something right now. Cause I'm actually not quite sure how I think and feel in the moment. And we sat there and we talked and it was interesting to your guys point of, and I think in both of our minds, it was such this massive problem. But when we sat down, it was like, we fully listened to each other and the, and the tone of the conversation was just like the, the one that we're having. And I was like, oh, okay, so the foundation's there. If we trust each other, we've got each other's backs, you know, and, and at the end of the conversation, we found some, some action items to, to, to move forward. And, and I thought it was really sweet. At the end of the conversation, Emily says, do you feel like you said some things to me without hurting my feelings? 
And, and I, I was pretty floored by that, you know? And it was like, yeah, I do. I feel like I was able to express some things very clearly without hurting you. And she was like, okay, good. And then maybe now we have a little more data or feedback that we can do that more often than not, right? And we can really continue to do that. But it was, I just appreciate that all three of us have, are having these conversations with our partners and, you know, with the people we work with. <laughs> and, and Kale, you had mentioned before, you said work-life integration. And I think all three of us are on the same page that there is no such thing as work-life balance. That's actually a myth. It's life. And then you decide where you want to put your time and energy into it. And then one thing's not taken away from the other. Um, and, and you realize, wow, we're having, we're in relationship with each other and we're in relationship with all things all the time. It's like really just in relationship to myself. I'm afraid of saying something that's going to hurt me. That's why I'm not sharing it with my wife, or with my staff. And I think if you get to that point, it's like, man, then you can really open up and have these conversations. Dude, that's as, great. I, as I look back, one, one of the things that, as you know, as I'm just reflecting on something Nick just said, it triggered uh, this work-life balance bit. You know, as I look back at trajectories of different folks I've worked with and also in my own life, you know, back when I was in corporate, it feels like a lot of the work-life balance conversations would would come from a place of they're trying to separate the two. And I feel like especially as us as entrepreneurs, uh, as we lean into this space, there tends to be a, well, one, just, you know, the, the path itself that got us to why we are choosing to work for ourselves and pursue this work in the way that we are, is there's a sense of integration more rather than compartmentalization. Mm -hmm. Integration of like, we believe in our work strongly enough. We care about what we're doing. We like what we're doing. We may not always like every single day, but we're in it for a long haul goal, desire, fulfillment of something within ourselves that it's no longer compartmentalization. It's just the, it, we, we still find the balance. Like you were saying, Kale, you know, even though you were working like crazy and learning like crazy and you had all these big ambitious goals, you were still trying to find the right time with your family and kids, even though you may be working seven to seven or whatever the hours may have been. So it's more like trying to find the balance rather than compartmentalize, which is what I think a lot of folks get that confuses when we try to tune out work or try to create breaks from the drudgery. Yeah. Then you need a lot of balance to keep up with the drudgery. Mm. Uh, and there are hard days in entrepreneur's world too. You know, so certainly that exists, but if we start to look at it from like, how do I want to integrate my life and how do I want to bring these pieces together such that it's a whole complete life? then I think that that concept of balance shifts. Mm. I'm curious yeah. to hear your thoughts there, Kale, too. That's the best I can verbalize, but I'm, I'm really curious that's, to hear your perspective. Good. That was pretty yeah. damn good. I think you nailed it. I think you nailed it. I think uh, when people look at the work-life balance side, a lot of times what it happens is it creates a space for them where they're running from something rather than running through or to something. And they see their work as just something that they have to do, or they see their family as something that they have to do. And instead of figuring out, cool, this is the life that I have. And Nick, you mentioned something really key here, which is you and your wife, Emily, you're on the same team. Mm -hmm. Like you're aligned, you got each other's back and you're on the same team. And that's so key to remember, especially when it comes to family. But when you think through this, the work-life balance, you know, how you show up at work is also, it's going to be impacted by how you how your home life is and how your home life is, is going to be impacted by how your work is it's not like we have switches where we can just turn a switch off or on and become a completely different human right unless we have an actual psychological problem um but there that's a whole other thing and for most people you know it it's a big deal how you spend most people the average people right they spend 40 hours a week mm -hmm. the out of work and maybe in and if you add in 10 hours total with lunch breaks and commutes or we're working at home and they're working overtime or whatever it might be that's a lot of time that you're spending with a work family a work team um, around people that are different than your family it's a large majority of your life and there needs to be you can't be thinking cool this is my own work life and my family's totally different it's it's all works together especially as an entrepreneur especially as an entrepreneur because you need your family there to be your, if they're not working with you in the business you need a cheerleader. You need someone who has your back, mm -hmm. right, Nick, who you're on the same team and you yep, guys are totally. working together and, and being able to move forward and whatever that goal is that you have. 
Yeah, there's there's a there's a story that's coming to my mind. Probably like I don't know, maybe four four or five years ago, and and I had spent I'd probably spent five to seven years teaching individuals and coaching one on one, right before we opened Tribe. And I remember a couple of years into, into Tribe, I was having like an existential life crisis, and mm-hmm. I'm talking to my wife, and I'm like, I don't feel like I'm doing anything anymore. Like I'm not affecting people's lives. Like I'm not having any impact. And she had to coach me for an hour to to help me realize that I was actually having way more impact than I had ever had before, but it didn't look like what I was used to. And I'm sure you guys have gone through that too, but it was to your point, it was so cool to have someone on my team, in my family being like, you can't see what's going on at all. You're blind because you're too in it, you know? And, and it took her to step yeah. me out of it and be like, you're having so much more impact. It's like, oh shit. Okay. And then it was fun again, by the way, because you know, cause it was, that was not a fun yep. time. So yeah, I think it's so important to have people you trust that'll give you honest feedback and tell you the truth. Um, and really, and you're right, that, that have got your back. You know, and, and something that, Kayla, I was noticing you were saying like, you know, people think they have to go to work or they have to go to this. It's like, no, you don't. Like you get to choose when you're in an integrated state of what do you want to spend to invest your time and energy into? And if it's 20 hours of, of work, great, own it like fully own it and then you won't have the stress in the background telling you like oh i should be at home with my kids or i should be relaxing mm-hmm. like no this is what i want to be doing and if uh-huh. you can get to that empowered state then it's you realize oh it's all my time and i'm actively choosing how i want to spend it and who i want to be with then life gets very free and very integrated and there is no shift of like i got my work hat on and my family hat it's like oh, i'm i'm nick kale nothing moving through the world <laughs> What are we doing now? Oh, we're having this conversation. Cool. Okay. What are we doing afterwards? Okay. Meet team meeting. What's next? Oh, yep. lunch, you know, time with the family. It's freeing. Exactly. It really is. I think that's the, one of the secrets of being a, an entrepreneur. If you can touch those spaces, like then it gets fun. Yeah. I think a lot of it too is not judging, being easy on yourself, not judging yourself so hard. Mm-hmm. Right. When, when you think about the different rules and beliefs that we acquire over time and either through our upbringing or through our experiences, the reward systems that have been placed in our life, um, it will impact our the way that we look at the world. And a lot of times we think, oh, I have to do this thing. So the weekends have to be for X, Y, and Z and hanging out and relaxing and doing that. But for an entrepreneur, any if you talk to any entrepreneur, they're like, I'd rather just work every day. Like, I just, I just want to keep working. I enjoy it. And yeah, I may need some breaks and I need some time and all this stuff, but like, I genuinely enjoy what I do, even through the hardships, even through the hard times Mm -hmm. and those little micro things that I don't like to do, I still am working towards a bigger end goal and a bigger purpose. And I think it's important for people to really, this goes back to not sugarcoating it with, you don't, you can't just not sugarcoat it with other people. You also have to not sugarcoat it with yourself and you have to be willing to understand, cool, this is how, this is who I am. And be completely okay with the fact that, cool, I am different than everybody else, right? Um, an example mm-hmm. of this would be, you know, my in-laws, they are incredible human beings and they helped invest in the first gym that we started and they've supported us and they're incredible. But, you know, they both worked nine to five jobs. My father-in-law was a correctional officer for 25 years. And I remember asking him when I first met him, one of the first questions I asked him about his job was, you know, when did you start counting down to retirement? And he was like, the day I walked in. And I immediately, mm. in my brain, I was like, I can't imagine living mm. and working a life where I can't wait to retire and get out of that job. And I, they, for a long time, you know, when we were struggling and they were trying to be helpful, they were like pushing me to go and get more of a traditional government job or firefighting or all these things. And, you know, I knew that that wasn't for me. That's not what I wanted. And thankfully I never went down that road. And, but for, it's really important for people to understand that you don't have to be like everybody else. There are no rules. And if you enjoy working, work. If you don't enjoy working, find something else or figure out another way to make a living and do that. It's totally fine. Um, but don't get stuck living someone else's life because it's, it's so cliche, but it's like, it's, you have one life, like this is it. So make the most of it and do what you want to do rather than trying to live a life to please other people. I'm so glad you brought yeah. up the that concept of retirement. It's it's something I once wrote a whole blog article around because I think people oh, nice. get there's like a there's like a almost a fantasization with this concept of retirement, you know. And yet, like most people that I've seen, the elders that sort of quote unquote retired, uh, yeah, I think there it brings a sense of peace. But I also see them just like trying to pass time mm-hmm. in their retirement, like just 
trying to get by, it, you know, mm. a, a month, a year of retirement, they're bored out of their minds, you yes. know, and they look back and like, man, I wish I would have spent time figuring out what I really wanted to do. So I don't really even have to worry about retirement. And I'm trying to get that point across to a lot of people that I coach that, you know, they, there tends to be this shift that needs to happen to say like, retire to what, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. Uh, the word why, don't, why not spend that? Yeah. <laughs> why not spend the, the time to figure out what you actually enjoy doing? And if you mm -hmm. don't have the skill set, let's go build that skill set and work towards it mm -hmm. so that you can actually enjoy your time now and continue to grow. And like you said, Kale, you know, become the person you really aspire to be. And then if at some point, yeah, you know, you want to quote unquote retire to something different, you want to pursue a career in music or something very different than what you do today. Sure. By all means, go for it. Right. Cause you, you built the financial safety net and all the support you need to be able to go be a little bit adventurous, uh, but live. Yeah. What if instead I mean, of retirement, word, it was pivot. Huh. What if it was just pivot? Yeah. You're just going mean, to pivot to something else. Yeah. The word retire means to become tired again. Like I'm not <laughs> signing up for that. Like you're telling me I got to work my whole life to then be tired again. Like what that's <laughs> I'm out, I'm out, I'm out. I, I, you know, but this is, this is how entrepreneurs think. I think it's gotta be in your DNA, by the way, to be, to be an entrepreneur. Like you gotta love it. Um, are you guys familiar with the icky guy? Have you followed that framework at all? Yeah. Oh yeah. I, mean, I think that's kind of what we're getting to here now of the, the icky guy of the Japanese philosophy of, you know, what are you good at? What do you like to do? What has a mission in the world and, and what provides you with an income? And if you can do all of those four things, you can hit your sweet spot. And I, I tell people all the time, like if you can get two out of two or three out of those, you're ahead of the game. You know, find the things you're passionate about that can provide you a, a, li a livelihood and have impact on your, on your society. Like that's the win, win, win. And then I'm sure you guys like, Kale, what would you, if someone gave you a hundred million dollars tomorrow, my money's on, you're still showing up for work. Like I, just, I would doubt, I would doubt that you go to a beach and that's it. We never see you again. Oh, I just gosh. don't think that's a reality. I would lose my mind. Nothing changes. I just, maybe I'd play more golf on the weekends and travel more. But other than that, nothing changes. Mm -hmm. I'd still show up to work because I think this is something that has helped me. And I don't know if it'll help other people, but I noticed, you know, there's quite a few, it seems to be a topic within the recent generations, as well as kind of my generation as well, millennials and people below us, younger than us, where this like goal is to just achieve retirement or happiness, right? And it's like, they, if we're trying to search for happiness or contentment or peace all this time, and that is the end goal, you're never going to find it because you're just going to keep trying to find it. And what has to happen is you have to fall in love with the moments today. And it, it's obviously being centered in right now. And for me, what I found is that I just genuinely enjoy work and the rewards that work gives me, regardless of like winning, right? I, I love winning. I, I want to win. But I've noticed from a young age that let's say I won something or our team won a, a tournament or a championship or whatever. That moment that we won, it was, it was fleeting. It happened for a split second and then it was on to the next season and it was on to the next thing. And I immediately recognized that as a young kid and realized that winning wasn't the actual outcome. It's I want to just keep playing the game and it's the work that works more on me and I learn more from the work and I become a different person and different human and reach that potential, right? That we're talking about by falling in love with the work and the work can be really hard. That's where the pain and suffering is. That's where, you, but the reward of that is like the person you become, the impact that you're able to make and the change you're able to make in the world is through that work. And if I think if more people fell in love with the act of growing as a human, whether that's through learning, constantly learning or growing, I think there would, people would be a lot more content in the world period and have a much more purposeful life and feel more peace in their life. Um, at least in that area, if they were just more focused on allowing themselves to be okay with, you know, not every day is going to be great. And, but you know what, today I'm going to work through it and I'm going to show up and through it and I'm going to get better through it. And knowing that at the end of the day, and by the end of this week or next month or years down the road, I'm going to be a different person. And it all has to come through this, this focus on working through it. Yeah. I think if, if life could be summed up in a few words, I think learning would be a very key word uh, yeah. in that, in that narrative, because there's just, uh, we're, we are always constantly growing and learning. And it, there is, there does tend to be a uh, almost 
call it an invisible force or something that's, you know, there's always challenges being presented in front of us personally or mm -hmm. professionally, calling us to grow into them, calling mm -hmm. us to become something larger than we are today. And a person that's found their footing, you know, no matter how choppy the waters are. And those are the days, of, you know, whether you're in a, corp a, a traditional job or even the world of being an entrepreneur, there are days that look bright and sunny and happy. And then there's the days that are like dull, choppy, you know, challenging. And being able to become a person that can find the center line through both. You know, I think, uh, I don't know if it was the Buddha, but, you know, one of the spiritual leaders uh, talking a lot about this notion of they don't go too high when the day the days are too bright or the you know the big successes don't let that get get you carried away and the don't go too low when you know there might be a big defeat or a point of uh, feeling like something is really wrong uh, or just mm -hmm. maybe perhaps just emotionally feeling low being able to become a person that can find the center line and keep growing through all of those experiences uh, I think yeah. is so key because there's this concept that, yeah, especially I think in Gen Z, I'm hearing this a lot around financial independence, retire early. And, uh -huh. you know, that's where typically I often raise the question of like, well, what do you want to retire to? We can all go spend a week mm -hmm. on the beach but may, and maybe a month at max. And then we're bored out of our mind. So what do you want to really retire to? Why don't we actually ask that question of what do you truly desire in your life? And then let's go incrementally, step by step, day by day, you know, big visions, tiny steps, build yeah. towards that so that you can truly retire into something you love doing. Yeah. I love that. Yeah. Kale, I'm wondering, as, as Nathan's kind of riffing on that, um, something I had written down written down earlier was how do you stay how do you stay motivated in those low points you know how do you stay motivated when you're up against failure or or setbacks i've been rewarded in my life in the past so it's trained me that if i as long as i don't quit i still have an op opportunity to win and the motivation for me is again the the person i'm going to become so one of my biggest goals with our portfolio right now is to grow it and being in the private equity game, it's, you know, we're bought. Now the goal is to continue to grow it and then sell it again to somebody else. And that's the game that I'm playing now. And my goal is to get it to a sizable exit and valuation. And the reason why I want to do that is I want to know what type of man it takes to do that and who does Kale become. And so on those hard times, I keep going back to that of, you know what, this is what hard feels like. And you've already gone through hard in the past. Like COVID for me, I was talking to Maggie last night about it. She was asking me, she's like, Sometimes you feel it seems like you don't really care in the sense of like you, you don't really get too frustrated, don't really get too happy either way, and you just kind of are going through it. And, you know, I was like, yeah, that's because while it's hard right now, that's nothing like it was during COVID. It's really nothing like it was when we were making a thousand dollars a month, fifteen hundred dollars a month, two thousand dollars a month as a family with a one year old living out of one bedroom studio apartment. Like it's not it's nowhere near that. Our problems are different. And I know that if I keep showing up every single day and I keep attacking the problems, trying to find the constraints and show up for our team and show up for myself, for my wife, for my family, that no matter what, regardless of the outcome, I will know that I did my best. And I will know that I did everything in my control and power to set us up for, the, for hopefully a successful ending to whatever happens, right? Or transition into something else. And that's what helps me a lot, knowing that, you know what? Every other successful person, Elon Musk, Jeff Bezos, Mark Zuckerberg, all these incredible CEOs, any athlete that you talk about, they've all gone through struggles. And something that Alex told me and continues to harp publicly as well as for me is, you know, like, what is the story that you want to tell? And the harder, the bigger the hardship, the better the story. And for me, I, I, I actually use that as motivation. I'm like, great, now I'm going to prove him wrong. Because again, baseball helped me a ton because I was always the smallest kid. I was always like the least athletic, the least genetic ability. I just had to outwork everyone. And I had to feel like I had to prove everyone wrong. Um, I remember when I was playing Little League, I was eight years old, nine years old, first time playing in Florida. And the coach for our Little League team was a former big league pitcher for the Indians. 
And I looked up to him like crazy. Like here I am a nine-year-old obsessed with baseball and I get to be coached by a former big league pitcher. And I remember him telling me, he's like, you should give up baseball. You're not going to play. You're not any good. And I remember going home during that. I almost gave up during that season. I remember going home and crying after striking out to end a game. It's a little league game, but in my head, it's the biggest thing. I let my team down. I let myself down. I'm embarrassed. I got one hit that year, one hit all year. I didn't play much, but I got like one hit. That was it. And I was playing with 12 year olds. I was playing up, but at the end of the day, I had higher expectations for myself. And, and I remember almost giving up. And, but then I remember my dad came in and he was like, nope, you're going to stick this season out because you gave him your word because you committed to me, to the team, to everyone else. You're going to do it after the season. If you don't want to play, that's fine. Got to the end. I was like, no, I want to play again. Next year got maybe 10 or 12 hits. I'm 10 years old playing with 12 year olds. Then the next season got like played way better. 12 year old played way better. And then it just continued to build and build and build. But you know, I was one step away, one decision away from never doing that. And my life would look completely different. But mm -hmm. that lesson as a kid of number one, my dad helping me, holding me accountable to that, to the commitment that I made. And also the fact that I wanted to prove people wrong. It was an amazing lesson that continues to serve me today. Yeah. The power of commitment, you know, uh, yeah. like when we do, we go into these modes of exploration, but like when we do pick a route, there is got to be a, some definite amount of time and energy that we pour into a decision before we choose to call it. How do you think about that now in the eight, like the days of business kale? Like when do you keep going after something, you know, and how do you determine how long will we keep pursuing something until, until you pivot? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, I think I look, so I don't know, depending on the listeners, my situation is slightly a little bit different than maybe some, but maybe it's very similar to others. I look at the, what's the TAM? Like, what's the total possibility that I have of like, I think of it in TAM, total addressable market, but it's not total addressable market. It's more of like, what's the potential that is available within this opportunity that we have? And we do that. I make those decisions by gathering data on whatever might be happening. And within our business, it's like, what's the total addressable market with gyms? What's the total addressable market within CRMs? What's the total addressable market within supplements? And I look at the possibilities there. And then you take in all the, all the accounts of, or the other variables such as competitors, our resources, our goals, what differentiates us, differentiates us from everybody else. And can we then execute on the plan? But if I know strategically that there is a great, there's a huge amount of upside with manageable risk, then I know we're moving in the right direction. And we just then have to continue on past these small bumps and problems that we're going to face. A good example of this was we chose Alex tasked me back in 2021 with building an outbound sales process for gym launch. And we, we, the reason why we did that is strategically, we needed another channel for sales. And we knew that outbound worked because our LTV on our clients was enough to where we were able to make this a possibility. So we studied it, we did it. And we also knew that there are thousands of businesses that are doing this successfully. It's not a matter of if it works, it's a matter of how do we make it work for us? So then it's like, cool, we know that this can work. We just have to then figure out how do we make it work for us? And so we went through months months guys of just like terrible show rates, no pickups, all this stuff until we figured out a way to be able to get gym owners to show up to a call. And then it started working. And I think it's a great example of like, you're going to have, as long as the macro lines up with the potential success, the micro things then is just, you're going to hit these roadblocks. It's just now figuring out, cool, how do I solve this constraint right now? Knowing that the long-term picture, it works. Mm -hmm. I think what's, what's cool is and something we always try to do here is, is bring this down to the listener level. Like we were talking last week with another guest around nutrition. This is the same process. Okay. How much weight do you want? How much weight do you want to lose? I want to lose 20 pounds. Okay. Here, that's going to take 20 weeks. Okay. Can you do that? Maybe. What if we gave you a plan? All right. Well, how am I going to do it? You're going to exercise three times a week. <laughs> You're going to start eating better. You're going to start tracking your macros. I don't know. That's a lot. Okay. Let's just start with exercise. Can you do that? Okay. I can do that. And then we just build, we stack. Like you said, you stack skills. Like it, it's, so, it's always so cool. We're all playing different games, but the games, the rules to this, to some extent are the exact same. They just get bigger. And, and, and what I want to name here, and I think what we're talking about is we're talking about being process orient, oriented rather than goal oriented. Mm -hmm. And I've noticed as I've made that shift in the last year or two, I have way less stress, way, way less anxiety on myself. And I'm also not judging myself as much about where I should be. But it's like, here's the process. Here's where we're going. And today, did we take one step 
closer to where we're going? Did we do one thing that got us one step closer? And I think if you can break it down to that digestible approach to your life, whether it's relationship or health or business, it's like, yeah, we can do that. You can you can see where you're going and do one thing today to, to, to get a step closer. And that to me gets pretty manageable and something that's sustainable. Like to me, that sounds like a pace you guys are describing a business that you can keep doing. Yes, 100%. I think I love the part that you mentioned process oriented. I think that setting goals without a process or a plan is setting yourself up for future broken promises. And it's so important. So yeah, I, th- I'm, I love that you brought that up. Hmm. What did you just say? You said setting goals without a process or plan is setting yourself up for future disapp- disappointment? Future broken promises to yourself or mm-hmm. to the company or to whoever. Can you say a little bit more about that, Kill? when you say broken promises? Yeah. So a goal, if you think about it, is like it's a promise to yourself or to the company of an outcome that you want to achieve. And so if you break it down, it's like, cool, uh, we are, even though it's not like written in stone, but when you write it down, a goal, you're in a sense making a binding contract with yourself to want to hit that. And so you're in a sense promising to yourself or the team that this is our goal. We're going to do what we can to hit it. But if you don't create a plan or an action plan, all you're doing is setting yourself up for a future broken promise because there's no way you're going to mm-hmm. hit it. Yeah. And so that's, that's, the, that's the fun part. Setting goals is really fun. It's the vision. It's the dream. It's let's get to this. But if I don't create a plan and I don't do the dirty work to actually make it happen and we think through the process and then stick to it, even when the going gets tough, then we're just setting ourselves up for a future broken promise. And that's what leads to, if we think about it with our teams, if we're not hitting our goals consistently, if we're leaders within teams or entrepreneurs, your teams start to get dejected. They start to now have a belief that we're never going to hit it, that we're never going to be successful, that it's always, we're always losing. And for yourself, if you keep doing that, like you think of all the people that set New Year's resolutions, which again, without a plan or just, you're, again, it's a broken promise. It's a future broken promise that you're making to yourself. And you think of how that stacks up year over year when you're not keeping your own promises and you keep lying to yourself and not doing the things that you need to, the, that continues to stack and lead into other areas of your life because it's easier to slide into something else. It's like, cool, you know what? I'm going to skip the gym today. I'm feeling a little tired after the weekend. It's Monday. And then Tuesday rolls around after you told yourself, promised, my goal is tomorrow I'm going to go to the gym. But you know what? You didn't set your alarm. You didn't go to bed in time. You allowed yourself to stay up. You watched Netflix or whatever, and you didn't have a plan in place and stick to it. So then what happens Tuesday? You sleep through your alarm. You hit the snooze button. You get up late. You get to work late. And then you're like, ah, shoot. And now you beat yourself up over it. And instead of, hey, if I have an action plan, I stick to the action plan. I do it and I reach my goals. There's something there about like like this sense of commitment uh, to the goals, you know, that brings out just that right amount of edge and firepower. That's like, Mm. you know, even though you might be feeling a little tired and you see the alarm go off, there's some, you know, you can easily hit and be like, "Eh, I'm just gonna doze off a little bit. And I'm talking about myself when I, when I'm talking about this example and there's other days when it's like, (laughs) you know, damn it, forget this lethargy. I'm going to get up and go do the thing that I need to go do, you know, whether it's meditate, exercise, get my day started. And I would love to just like maybe spend a couple minutes, just explore this aspect of commitment and maybe how, Mm. if we can get to any kernels of truth around how we build commitment. Mm. I would love y'all's feedback on this. How do you guys do it? I tell people that's the first thing. That's, that's something that I find works really, really well for me. Kale is, If I tell you I'm going to do something, then I find that I will. So I've noticed I need some external drivers, some external motivation. I've even found that being an entrepreneur, that that's why I have a team. I will, if I tell my team I'm going to do something, I will. If I tell myself that I'm going to do something, I I probably will. It won't be done as fast. It won't be done as well. So that's, that's something. And then the other thing I think about is like, am I willing to give up the life that I have now for the life that I want later? That, that drives me a lot. That that's a that's a big one that drives me, and it's like my life might be good right now, but I have these moments when I'm like, this isn't good enough, and not from a judgment place, but from a like I want more of my life. I have I have higher standards, so think about that of like, what am I willing to give up now for what I want to create later, and then touching that continually, like writing it down and seeing it and dreaming about it and telling people about it, and it's like, and then what I've noticed is I become the type of person that that does the things that he says that he will. And then I have data 
And it's like, you know what? I, and then I trust myself and I have faith in myself that I'm going to do the things that I set out to do. And, and when I envision something, I can go and create it. And I think then it becomes like, oh, well, then this is just what I do. I brush my hmm. teeth. I meditate. I wake up. I work hard. I go to the gym. I affect the world around me. And it's like, someone's going, man, how'd you do so much today? And I'm like, wait, what? What do you mean? How did I do so much? That was just a regular day at the office. Like I actually felt like I didn't get that much done. But to your average person who hasn't built these skills and all these different dimensions that we've been talking about, it's a lot of hard work. And I think that that's what I try to do is really envision what do I want to be and how, how do I want to be and take actions tor- towards it daily, daily. Yeah. I love that. Nathan, how about you? Yeah. How do you do it? Yeah. Um, so this kind of goes back to my coaching practice and why I named my coaching practice what it is. It's called Sankalp, which uh, is a Hindi word, Sanskrit word that means uh, heart and mind aligned determination. Mm. And mm. I extend that into heart mm. and mind aligned determination for what we want to create in our life. Mm. And so I remember, you know, these days I've been talking a lot about my own story. And so whether it was my struggles with, uh, you know, growing up in a household that wasn't financially abundant, whether it was money, later on, it was struggles around love. Then it was struggles around leadership, really showing up and not looking for others to take that stand. And once, uh, once it was clear that this was something I was not okay with my having in my life, you know, a lack of money or a lack of love or a lack of leadership in how I was showing up, that I think lit a fire under me to say, okay, I am, I'm, I'm having a really clear realization that I no longer desire this in my life. And so I desire something then saying, what do I, what do I desire? And once I am able to clearly articulate what I do desire, so there's a process of exploration of seeking out mentors and learning but once it becomes clear like i do not desire that and i do desire a different outcome i feel like going through that internal process sort of commits and there's days i fall short for sure i mean i just hit the snooze this morning and got lazy but there's a very clear recognition in my head that i let myself down in that moment this morning And so tomorrow morning is another day to live to the promise of sticking to the daily commitment that builds towards the longer term goals that I'm trying to create in my life. The person that I want to become who inspires others to be able to show up to their own goals, to their own desires. And so, yeah, there's there's some common themes with what Nick mentioned in terms of the people that we want to become and the process of how we go about creating that process of determination within these are great. I don't know if my way will make sense or not. This is kind of one way that I like the way that I kind of look through it, the lens. Um, loyalty means a lot to me. Um, it's one of the kind of core tenets of my own life is being loyal. And uh, that means a lot of different things. But the way that I use it to shape how I show up and my commitment is through I think about it and I'm like, I could go through life and I'm loyal to my wife. I'm loyal to showing up to my team. I'm loyal to my kids. I'm loyal to, you know, business and all these things. But many times in life leading up to when I started really practicing this, I was loyal to everybody else, but to, and I was not loyal to myself. And the moment that I then switched that frame of reference or that f- reframe this in my mind of the only way that I can truly show up the best and be show my loyalty commitment all these things, the best for everyone else is if I first am loyal to myself and my dreams and my goals and the person that I want to become. And every time that I say that I hit the snooze button, or I say yes to something I should have said no to, or I say no to something I should have said yes to, or I don't show up well, or don't prepare well. And I do all these things, you know, I am disloyal to my future self, disloyal to my current self and disloyal to the person that I want to become and the man that I know I can become. And I've tied it into something that I had, it took me a while to kind of think through this. And for some people, this will not resonate whatsoever because of the loyalty aspect. But for me, it does because loyalty is so key for me. It's like a big part of my life and um, being trustworthy, having integrity and showing up for the people in your life. And, you know, it's, that's how, that's just one of the ways that I think through it and has helped me kind of reframe that and shape my commitment to showing up for myself first so that 
then I can then show up for everyone else. And that commitment by committing to myself, even through the hard times and the things I don't want to do, it does make me better for everyone else because I do want my kids to have an incredible dad and incredible life. And I want almost more than anything else. I want my wife to have an incredible husband, an incredible life and, you know, be loved and supported and feel secure. And I almost want that more than anything else, more than what I want. And I think as married men, we will agree with that, right? We want our wives to feel incredible, our families to feel safe and secure and create a better world for them. And I realize that if I am constantly always serving them and loyal to them and saying no to the things for me, then I can't actually show up and create that world for them. And yeah. that kind of helped me a lot, be able to reshape my commitment to these smaller things. Mm. That's, that's powerful. And I just get, I get such a sense from you, Kelly, you're, you're a man on a mission, you know, and that's, that's really at the, the core of, of who you are and what you're doing. And I was on a call with you guys maybe a month ago and you were talking about something. It was like, we're going to go out there and we're going to save people's lives and we're going to change the world. And we're going to like, and we're going to, and I got off the call with you and I was like, I'm going to run through a fucking wall after hearing you speak, you know, and I went to my team yeah. and I was like, we're going to run through a wall. We're going to go out there and save lives. And, but I told my team, I said, it's been a long time. I've heard a man speak with such conviction uh, mm. and, and such a clear mission on who he is and why he's in the world. And I just really commend that. And that's something Nathan and I, that's one of the reasons why we have this show is so we can get examples of people in the world who are living on their own terms and, and shaping realities and affecting their communities. So um, it's really been an honor to, to have you on and to, to see how clear you are and the conviction you have for yourself, your family, your company. Um, so we really appreciate it. Is there, is there anything you'd like to leave us with, Kale? Any, any words of wisdoms or uh, any ways people can, can get in touch with you and kind of learn more from you? This has been amazing. This has been one of the most fun podcasts I've been on. And I genuinely appreciate right. you guys taking the time to do this. I love it. The the deeper conversations on this and not just taking it at surface level. I really appreciate that. It's challenged me um, just in these this short little conversation. So um, other than that, no, I have no other words of wisdom, nothing else. Just I hope that the listeners, you continue to listen to this because this is an exceptional podcast um, that you guys are running. So keep just whatever you're doing, keep doing it. So if anybody does want to follow you. me, I just go to at Kale Owen across all social media and do that. So, Brad. All right. Kale, thank you so much. Nithin, thank you for your time and presence as always. And if you're listening, if this helped you, you know, share it with someone who you think is going to help change their lives. Remember to subscribe and, um, you know, share all the good stuff in here. So, thanks so much, guys. Appreciate your time and uh, we'll catch you on the next episode.